You know, something that I noticed, you obviously had this very public role before in Congress running the Freedom Caucus. Senator, you still have a very public role. But your job now, Mr. Meadows, is yeah. uh, a little bit more of a behind-the-scenes job. Could you maybe take us behind the scenes a little bit into uh, what that day looks like? Well, obviously, they've got cameras rolling here, so I don't know that it'll be too much behind the we scenes. But, but I will say this, uh, you know, since I've come over and we're, we're almost at, at day uh, 85 on this job, uh, I've done no press. So it's, yeah. it's, it is it's it's a behind the scenes. So to bring everybody behind the scenes, I think that the real key is I see the job is to serve the president of the United States who serves the American people. But it's also to make sure that every good idea that is in the Senate yeah. gets the visibility with the president of the United States uh, in, a, in a nanosecond. And so one of the things that people don't realize is that I can get a phone call from Senator Cruz or uh, Senator Blunt or uh, Lindsey Graham. And they're saying, you know, listen, we've, we've got this, uh, this issue. We need you to take care of it. Sometimes it's just as simple as uh, we've got some constituents that have raised this concern. We want to make sure the president of the United States knows about it. And Ted, Ted can vouch for this. It's a phone call. Hmm. And, and within minutes, the president of the United States is weighing in on that particular issue. Yep. It's yep. nothing like anything I've ever seen. And it, it's trying to be the gatekeeper behind the scenes that uh, maybe is not as much of a gatekeeper is, is their megaphone within the West wing. Hmm. And so, Senators have better access, I think, to this president than yep. historically has been the case. Uh, I think that's a good thing. Uh, the closer the president is to the American people, the more he hears from from the people of Texas through through Ted or the the people of South Carolina through Tim Scott or Lindsey Graham or whichever senator it might be, the better off it is. And so. Uh, uh, but it's also the power of the executive branch. You know, when when I was in Congress, I was saying, boy, I, I, all I wanted to do is make sure that Congress was empowered. Right. Well, it's a little bit different role now, <laughs> but we, if we work hand in glove, I think what we can do, this president is willing to do things that most presidents are not willing to do uh, uh, and and take political risk. Yeah. You know, we've had, we have an embassy that uh, in, in Jerusalem is something that Ted and I yeah. share passionately together. That would, it's been promised before, you know, and, and it never happened. Uh, and Both so it, Republican and Democratic presidents have broken that promise. They have. And Trump is the first one to follow through on it. I, I have true. to make a confession. When President Trump, when he was running and he said, I'm going to move the embassy in, in Israel to Jerusalem, I just didn't believe him. I said, that's the sort of thing people say, but then they don't actually do it. And I think a lot of people in Washington thought that. And then when it actually happened, everybody was so surprised. One thing that's really unusual in this administration is, is the kind of lead person on, on Israel policy uh, has been the U.S. ambassador to Israel, David Friedman, who's mm. a great guy. He's become a close friend. And, and it's unusual. I don't know of any instance where an right. ambassador has had that kind of influence. No. And it's because the president knows and trusts him. And David mm. is, is passionately committed to strengthening the U.S.-Israel relationship. But I, I worked very closely with David after the president made the announcement. Yeah. Because, look, the nature of Washington, the swamp, the State Department, Foggy Bottom, did yeah. not want this to happen. Mm -hmm. So here's how they would normally kill it. They would just slow roll it. We need to study for a year the feasibility. <laughs> we need to do a security assessment. Mm -hmm. we, need to, we need to do this and that. And their plan, it was clear what their plan was going to be, delay it four years. Yep. Right. They were hoping Trump loses re-election, and then the, next, the Democrat who comes in will cancel the announcement. Right. And, and what the Trump administration did, and David was the point person, I said, David, the only way this happens is if you open the damn embassy. You don't announce it. Right. You open it. And they found a facility that was a consular facility in Jerusalem and within a year opened the damn thing. I've, I've never seen anything like it. And, and it there was hasn't been. tenacity. And, and the bureaucracy at state was shocked. Yeah. But, but that <laughs> so behind the right. scene, like the urgency of understanding Oh, and, and, and so true. And you talk about behind the scenes. So one story that I don't think is out there is, so the State Department pushing back, you know, continuing to push back. I think they gave a list of the pros and cons. And so there were a whole long list of all these cons. Yeah. Zero pros for You're moving. Kidding. Yeah, no, no, I'm telling you. <laughs> that, not I mean, that subtle. That, you no, know, I, and so that's something <laughs> yeah. that doesn't get reported. So it literally oh was, you got all these reasons not to do it and no <laughs> reasons to do it. And yet this president stayed true to his campaign yep. promise. Yep. And, but, but it takes the encouragement 
sometimes it's a phone call from Ted Cruz in the middle of the night saying, you know, golly, it, it's the right thing to do. And, uh, and that affirmation makes a big difference. Well, this, what you said earlier is very interesting to me, this idea that the chief of staff is the gatekeeper. But the flip side is, it means you're the megaphone for good ideas. You're the megaphone mm-hmm. for ideas that you're hearing well, from people let, let like me give, Let me give a real-time example. So, yeah. so Mark's been in office a couple of months. Yeah. Um, you remember a couple of months ago, the president was meeting with CEOs, a bunch of big oil companies. Yeah. And, and I was really worried that at the time, and when the meeting was initially announced, it was just the CEOs of the giant companies. And so I called Mark That's and I said, right. look, I this, forgot is, about this. this is a real problem yeah. because the way energy works, yeah. there are a bunch of small independent producers, a lot of guys in Texas that aren't the you know, giant super majors that have the GDP of a country. But they're the innovators. They're the ones that drive the domestic production. And, and early on, they were not on the meeting invite list. And so I called Mark and said, look, this is a real problem. Yeah. We need to make sure we've got an independent producer there. Mark not only got it done, but, but said, look, you need to be there. And I got on a plane the next day. In fact, it was funny. When I walked in, there were a couple other senators there. They said, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I, I, funny you should ask. And, and, and it was because Mark said, come to the meeting. And at that meeting, you mm. want to talk about real action, we pressed a couple of things. Remember, price of oil was collapsing. Millions of jobs yeah. were in jeopardy. And two things came out of that meeting. Number one, the president leaned in hard against the Saudis and the Russians and got them to back off their economic warfare against the U.S. Right. But number two, the president directed, I suggested to the president, there was a real problem of capital being cut off from energy. Right. And, and I suggested to the president... If you would, you would instruct the Secretary of Energy, Dan Brietta was there, and the Secretary of, of, of the Treasury, Stephen Mnuchin, yeah. to make sure that, that, that Wall Street doesn't discriminate against energy and yeah. bankrupt every U.S. energy producer. And the president right there said, do it. He looked at Dan and said, make it happen. And that made a real, mm. real difference in terms of capital being available and literally saving millions of jobs in this country. Hey, Michael Knowles here. And the fact is, a life of cigars and scotch does not come cheap. So please be sure to subscribe to The Daily Wire on YouTube, because I depend heavily on your support to continue this wonderful, lib-triggering life. Thanks.